Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening. Ladies and gentlemen, wherever you are in the world, welcome to The Caring Economy with me, Toby Usnick. Today's a really wonderful day for me because we have Roberta Cordano, or Bobby as we like to call her. She is a value-driven leader focused on sign language and equity and education, economic opportunity and innovation and belonging as the president of Gallaudet University in Washington, DC. It is the only birth PhD education entity in the world that uses American Sign Language in every aspect of its daily education and operations. Always curious, President Cordano is guiding Gallaudet as it transforms to meet the demands of the 21st century. Being deaf is part of human diversity and Bobby is a fierce advocate for deaf people being embraced in all facets of society, showcasing the value contributions and the innate innovation of deaf people, as well as the power of sign language is at the heart of Bobby's leadership. Knowing that the true transformation can only happen if a multitude of perspectives and experiences are welcomed, Bobby is a vigilant infu at infusing equity, diversity, and inclusion in all aspects of Gallaudet University. She is focused on creating a welcoming and engaging experience for all students and strengthening efforts to ensure that they are active citizens at Gallaudet as well as in the community, nation, and the world. With wide ranging and extensive experience from her roles as a Minnesota Assistant Attorney General, Vice President of Amherst H. Wilder Foundation, Educational Administrator at the University of Minnesota, and founder of not one but two charter schools, Bobby knows the critical importance of education and access to opportunities and systems, particularly for marginalized communities. She's honored to be the first deaf woman and openly LGBTQ president and excited for the continued transformation and impact of Gallaudet University and what it will have on the lives of deaf people throughout the nation and across the globe. Bobby, welcome to the Cary Economy. Uh, well, thank you. Good morning, Toby. Thank you for having me here today. This is great. Bobby, we always begin our session by asking the guest to tell us a little bit about his, her, or their life journey, kind of where you came from, how you got where you got, maybe some of the knocks along the way or the pivots, um, but maybe you take two or three minutes to give us a little narrative of Bobby Cordano. Well, you know, Toby, that's always a tough question to begin with, because my story is one that could be quite lengthy, but what I'll do is try to give you just a summarized version, and you can ask further questions uh, as we go. But I guess I would begin here with just sharing the fact that I have deaf parents. Uh, both of my parents graduated from Gallaudet University, in fact, and I am the third generation deaf person on my father's side of the family. Now, my grandparents went to the Illinois School for the Deaf, and my grandfather actually tried to come to Gallaudet. This was the summer after his graduation, but didn't have sufficient financial uh, support, and so ended up having to go back home. I didn't quite know the full story, but the archives here at Gallaudet showed me some documents that showed he did make an attempt to come to Gallaudet, but never made it. Now, my father, on the other hand, did make it here, as did my mother. They met here at Gallaudet, married, and then moved to Wisconsin, where my father taught at the Wisconsin School for the Deaf in Delavan, Wisconsin. It's a small town in the southern part of the state. So in that town, there were about uh, 5,000 people as I was growing up, 3,000, 5,000 individuals. Now it's a little over 5,000, I think, who are residents of Delavan. But what's interesting is that community had so many deaf people because it housed the School for the Deaf. So I grew up very much a part of the deaf community. I grew up in a community of deaf leaders that uh, really created a network all across the United States. Because of my parents' connection to Gallaudet, they had this uh, very broad reaching community. Mm -hmm. um, so for example, um, Frank Sullivan was a very good friend of my parents. They were one, he was one of the first board members on this uh, trustee here at Gallaudet University who was deaf. He's a Gallaudet alum, I think graduated in 1954. And my father and he were very best friends. Wow. My mother's very good friend was named Gertie Galloway, and Gertie was the first deaf woman to become the superintendent of a school for the deaf. And right. she was the first deaf woman to actually lead the National Association of the Deaf. 
So she is a leader and has been recognized at the 150th anniversary here at Gallaudet for her extraordinary leadership and uh, successes. So my mother was very good friends with her and uh, they both got tattoos together for leaf clovers when they were in Hawaii together. So that just speaks to how close the two of them were in their relationship. But these leaders were people who I grew up with. They were household names in my family. And I met Frank many, many times as I was growing up. He would often tell me, you know, whatever you want to be when you grow up. And if I would say whatever it was, he would say, you can be anything you want, even president of the United States. So he believed in my full potential, always, always did. So I never believed that there were limitations or restrictions on me as I was growing up. I just understood this was the life that I had for my future. Other people were successful and I could be as well. So that really shaped the sense of hope and possibility and belief in what I could achieve. And I'll add to that, that uh, the, the second thing, the lesson that I learned through all of this is that deaf people can be successful. They can succeed doing anything when they have sign language. Mm -hmm. So if we all are able to sign, we can access one another, we can talk together, learn together, and there's a deep cultural richness that's a part of our community, mm -hmm. that sign language is seen as an asset, a benefit to all of us. You know, there's a famous quote that say it's deaf people can do anything except here. So that quote was one that was shared by the previous president, Dr. I. King Jordan, and everyone loved that quote. And it served us very well during that period of time when the world was so focused on a person's ability to hear and listen and auditory language and spoken language. But we have now entered a time in our world where we've recognized that sign language is a language of great importance. Sign language is a language of beauty. It's a language to be celebrated in its own way. So, you know, today the quote is instead, deaf people can do anything with sign language. Yeah. And I think that that is the contemporary quote of the previous one that builds upon our past. Yeah. I guess uh -huh. the other part of this would be that I grew up as a member of the deaf community and, uh, was within this community that there was a strong belief and uh, really a sense of active collectivism together. We would engage with one another, help each other personally and in the community. And I have two great examples of this. You know, anytime anyone graduated uh, from high school, if there was any family member of uh, uh, one of the Delavan family member communities who were, had a person who was graduating from high school, the family, the mother never threw the party for that child on their own. There were always six or seven other women who were there to help host the party for that child, the son and daughter of the family. So I grew up with mothers always coming, chiming in to help, you know, fathers always being there together, supporting whatever the need was personally, people came together to support one another. The second example I can share with you is that, well, in, in this community, uh, we had a tornado or would often have tornadoes frequently in that area and deaf community members were always concerned because we wouldn't hear the warning siren that everybody else in the community would hear. Wow. Deaf people would sleep right through a tornado and never knew what happened. So the community came together and I watched all of the adults working together alongside of the law enforcement, the, the fire department and the other members of the community to build an alert system. There was a box that had a, a red light that was linked to the city. So anytime something would happen, the red light would flash. And so we were able to innovate as members of our community with the officials in our hometown. So I've seen countless examples of this kind of thing. So many other examples I could share. But I think what I learned there is the power of community, collective action, and the power of just believing in others and supporting one another, regardless of a person's educational level, regardless of a person's occupation or who they were as individuals, they were accepted as a member and part of the community. And that's the community that I was raised in. And that has definitely made me a part of who I am. Um, and it's really been membership in this community that's allowed high hopes for me and all deaf children as well where they will support us. They watched us with great anticipation to see us accomplish new things. I can remember when I graduated from law school, one of the individuals, a family friend of mine, actually, my law school graduation party was one where the entire deaf community was in attendance. It was a deaf community event because I was able to achieve something in 1990 that was a great note for our community. So there's always been a responsibility that comes back to give back to the community that have been given so much to me. As president, I'm able to shape so many lives here at Gallaudet and continue to prepare future leaders, future change makers, and future innovators as I was able to experience growing up and it happens every day here at Gallaudet and continues to still happen. So it's a great community to be a part of. 
That sounds awesome. I actually spent some formative years in the Midwest, so Ohio, Michigan, Illinois, so I can recognize the tornado warning stuff, but also um, the Midwestern values yeah. and, and charm. Do you feel that you are creating um, or facilitating the same kind of sense of community at Gallaudet? I have to believe the answer is yes. Well, right. If you ask people here on campus, they would probably tell you that the transform transformative moment of my life is when I understand, well, probably was uh, who I was as a president. I came to Gallaudet in uh, January of 2016 and mid-January, two weeks after I got this position, Snowzilla hit the Washington, D.C. Oh, wow. area. It was like a hundred year snowstorm that hit yes. and that snowstorm created an issue where we lost power on one third of our campus. So the dorms lost power and um, a lot of buildings did as well. A couple of dormitories went, went offline and had no power. I can remember going in and, and back then, you know, no one could come to campus, right? Uh, all of the uh, leaders who had the experience in dealing with this kind of thing were not unable to come to campus. And I'd only been on campus with two weeks. You know, I was the, um, there was a one person who had some experience in student affairs who was living on campus and another individual who came together with me to manage the entire situation and the crisis because we were the only ones here. And I can remember, um, well, the first I would say, being from the Midwest, I mean, those Midwest fruits are very helpful. I'd spent a good 30 years in Minnesota, so I know winter, I can deal with snow, right? So one of the first things was some of the students and people were saying that the students need to stay in the dormitory. And when I heard that, I thought, are you kidding me? Do you know how fast the temperature can drop overnight when there's no heat? Of course, these folks had no idea. So I insisted we do something different. We took over the hotel ballroom on our campus. And uh, there was another building that was out. These were apartments that housed uh, families with children. So mm -hmm. there were a number of families there. I have a residence on campus here as president. So I took uh, 14 of those families into my home and put them in all different rooms in the house there. And uh, I had happened to have just gone shopping. I had two boys with my spouse. And so the four of us had gone out shopping at Costco. So I had just fully stocked our freezer in the basement and I have two boys, right? So I knew I was ready for families and be able to provide support for them. And what ended up happening was, is that I had enough food to be able to uh, make waffles and pancakes. I think I didn't have a waffle maker at that time. So I made pancakes for all of the families and just served people who were there for breakfast. And I think, um, I went to the dormitory and saw some students and I said, let's get out there and shovel. We found shovels. I got the students up in the morning and we were up clearing a path for the cafeteria workers to make sure students with wheelchairs could get around, students who needed crutches to have a clear pathway. We didn't want to wait for you know people to be able to come, to be able to get the support here, but we wanted to make sure we could do the job that we could do to yeah. supplement the work that the uh, workers could do. So we got the students out there shoveling. There's pictures of me and the students shoveling away the snow. And I think that was the first experience of people understanding me as a female leading this community. And uh, we came through that snowstorm beautifully. And I think that's one of the favorite stories I have during the time. And it shows you what's possible. And um, it just shows you what's possible, I think. I remember it was probably midweek when the students came to my house and said, you know what, we need to get a communication out. We need to communicate to the community what's going on and what to expect. And so, um, you know, we wanted to make a video and I thought, how long will it take to add captioning to the video? I had been told by uh, Gallaudet previously when I wanted to do an interview video that it would take three to five days to be able to film it and then add the captions to it. And when I said that to the students, they're like, we can do captions before tomorrow morning gets here. So we decided to try that out and uh, the students got to my house. It was late, I'm thinking maybe 9.30. We started the recording at 11 p.m. We didn't finish till one in the morning. You know how students are. That's the way they work at that yes. time. Of, they're not on our professional hours, but we did this on student hours. And by the next morning at 9 a.m., they had a video with communications and captions all ready to go out. So that led me back to the communications team back at the time, a very different team than the one we have in place now. And for me to tell them, look, the students just set the gold standard for us. 24 hours, they had a video produced with captions and that will be the standard going forward that we were able to pull this off in 24 hours. Yeah. So um, you know, we gave them more time than the students needed, but nonetheless, it just reflects the creativity in a crisis like a snowstorm. And really, once again, just displays the beauty of our community. And for me as president, I think that was early in the days and that set the tone. Good old Midwestern snowstorm is nothing to be afraid of, right? Yeah. 
You are so right. When you said at the beginning how the guidance was to keep the kids in the dorms and you said, no way. I thought that's exactly where you're going to go. It's like, you get out and shovel the sidewalks because that's what you do in the Midwest. You get out and shovel and then you get the reward of sitting by a fire or having cocoa later. Um, so I, this, I, is, this is... This is exactly right. Yeah. yeah. Um, so your story right. is so vast. There's so much I want to ask you about, but in the interest of time, I'm just going to go right into... Gallaudet and the deaf community and speaking to my audience, which are largely made up of business people and uh, social impact folks and students. Um, what are some of the myths we should dispel right at the start about the deaf community? Any, I'm sure you've got a sort of a boilerplate list of things that I would want my listeners to know that they wouldn't necessarily know. Um, you know, what, what are the, the myths that need to be busted or some of them? Yeah, sure. Um, I guess the first one for me is a myth that I would want to address around this notion that deafness is a deficit in some way, mm -hmm. that deaf people don't have something. And what I can share with you is that no matter how a deaf person exists in the world today, whether they use sign language, and you know, many of them don't know sign language. Many deaf people just use spoken language or they communicate through writing. Regardless of that, this notion that we are somehow deficit-based individuals as human beings is a myth. And the reason I say that is because there's a great book that gives you so many wonderful stories mm -hmm. and it's called Deaf Gain. Mm -hmm. This idea behind Deaf Gain is we talk about hearing loss so often, the loss of something, and instead, we're kind of reflecting on deaf gain instead. And that's a framing that I found to be beautiful. It was written by a faculty member here at Gallaudet, uh, a collaboration of many different points of view and perspectives that were brought into this book. It's a great book. I would suggest people uh, definitely read it. But the important point here is that if we're to look at a deaf individual and their upbringing, because of the fact that the world is built and based on spoken language, we have so very often been seen as a minority. We've often been the one and only person who is deaf in an environment. We have to adapt when we go to the grocery store or to the bank or we want to get a loan or buy a car. Mm -hmm. We're constantly adapting to our environment. And so that creates us as individuals who are great problem solvers, solvers because the world's not built for us. And we've had to be very creative in response, especially when we're confronted with the situation that we have to deal with. Fascinating. So every team in corporate America needs that kind of creativity. We are great when it comes to solving problems, especially in a crisis situation, because we think quickly on our feet. The second thing that I can share is that Deaf people, I think, well, I know I've heard so very many times that, you know, you're going to have to learn to use spoken language because the real world out there is a world where everyone uses spoken language. Mm -hmm. And they often use that term real world. I can remember one time being asked by someone, you know, how do we prepare our students for the real world once they graduate from Gallaudet? And when they came to Gallaudet, I thought people even here were asking me that question. Well, let me tell you this in response. This world where people use sign language is a real world. In fact, it's more real than the world I think we've ever realized to exist. So being asked that question is an interesting one. I remember going to a conference when I had just become president and I saw other presidents boasting about how their universities contributed to the local economies. You know, University of Minnesota would always talk about the way that they're uh, an economic engine for the state of Minnesota. I mean, it's a good example. And every state university has that same line that they give. So it caused me to reflect on what Gallaudet's story was around that contribution. I mean, we produce graduates for the economy, of course, just like any other university. We're located in Washington, D.C., Right. We're a global institution. We don't just serve the state, but we're a global institution. Honestly, our mission is probably far greater than any other land grant university. I think if you looked at this on paper, we are, in fact, a very much a global university, fully responsible for educating of deaf individuals in the United States and globally. So, you know, when I was asking the question of some of the faculty members here as to what's Gallaudet's contribution, what's the value of the sign language economy? We decided to conduct a study here that after Gallaudet was founded, their first sign language class that was taught by deaf individuals teaching people in American Sign Language, 
through that sign language class, we saw the number of ASL classes continue to increase in higher education throughout the country because we were producing graduates here at Gallaudet who could then go out and teach others American Sign Language in this field. In 2014, we found that uh, teaching of American Sign Language in higher education uh, was worth $43 million. And so looking wow. to my team, I thought that's one data point. But I wonder, you know, that first number is just about the sign language economy. But as we looked at it further, we found that it's worth at least two to three billion dollars. So now we're talking big money, right? Mm -hmm. and that's a pretty real world if you want to talk about what the real world is, is comprised. Yeah. Money converts to jobs for both hearing and deaf people alike. So if you are a hearing person learning sign language, you have so many other options for careers in this sign language based economy and in the world well, hearing based economy. So you can do very good when it comes to the economic engine and providing services to the deaf community because there are very well paying jobs out there in the field of mental health, law, medicine, any field, any mm -hmm. profession. If you know sign language, you have a value add that you can uh, have in addition to your credentials and whatever uh, professional repertoire that you have to offer. I believe that. I um, We're going to talk about the film Coda in a minute, but I saw that even with the family, the main uh, characters in the film. Um, so I want to ask you about employers and the deaf community. I'm just going to share with you a few things I've gleaned in the past few weeks in researching for this interview, just as a sort of a, a scene setter. I understand that um, the Starbucks near campus there was not doing so well and they were about to close. And then they decided, uh, why don't we try and bring in deaf employees? And sure enough, deaf employees who could do American Sign Language turn that around very successfully. I also uh, know- Oh, there you go. I've got my Starbucks <laughs> mug right here. Yeah. And <laughs> then we have, um, we've had my friend Joe Evangelician before who's head of comms at JP Morgan Chase. I understand they're also the JP Morgan Chase branch, all employees. Uh, speak American Sign Language or Sign American. Mm -hmm, right. And then I've understood from some of your colleagues that um, if you want to engage or employ or have an intern from the deaf community, try to have more than one because usually in a minority, you're more likely to have a, a posse, a pal, or someone who can help you succeed. Um, so, so what words of wisdom or advice do you give to large and small employers who might want to do more after hearing this interview? or seeing this interview? Sure, sure. Well, I think the first thing is that all of these companies are finding that when they do business with the deaf community, they build a customer loyalty base that uh, can be built faster and probably represents a larger number than they otherwise would. Think about the Apple store as a great example. They hired a number of deaf individuals who were employed by Apple from Gallaudet and all of a sudden, all of these deaf people were coming in for services and products there. So that's one thing, is that it's an untapped customer market that's there. And one of our donors, actually, um, James McGuire from a Philadelphia insurance company, the reason why he uh, got his start in risk management insurance and the program here at Gallaudet is because he set up his business serving deaf, deaf members of the community years ago. And now it's a billion dollar company. He's just sold the company to a larger insurance uh, firm. So he's been able to give back to Gallaudet because the deaf community is the community that gave him the start that he has. And he has a wonderful story that he shares. Uh, he had a learning disability and he said that the deaf community was a niche market for his insurance company. And it gave him the start that he needed as someone who could hear. And that really shows the strength that we represent in that niche market for the um, general community. I had a chance to uh, talk to Jamie Diamond when he opened the new store here close to Gallaudet. And what I shared with him was that the behavior of the deaf community can teach you an awful lot about how to serve customers because it's a different experience. And let me show you what I mean by that. Please. If you have signing a uh, customer service, someone who provides customer service and can sign like they do here in DC, deaf people from all over the country would rather connect with that person on Zoom to communicate in their native language. Mm -hmm. So it's actually a global market that you can tap into as opposed to a local market. <laughs> so small stores can serve local small communities, but 
we are as deaf individuals part of a global community and we can connect through technology to that. individuals who share a common language with us, with us. So there's so much creativity that we have when we access one another. Companies have really not been able to tap into the potential of the market that we represent. If you hire one of our individuals to be your customer service representative and advertise that to the deaf community, then people will go to that individual to get services. You know, they will get out of the uh, telephone queue because they're not able to get AI support. They'll be able to break out of that queue and be able to get direct customer service support in their native language. Mm -hmm. So that's another thing. I think when you work with deaf people that it actually builds a practice and a muscle that otherwise wouldn't be built in the workplace. It forces people to embrace all kinds of diversity. Um, all different kinds of diversity. You know, I find that the deaf community, um, very often the first step in working with members of the deaf community is just being open to what it's like to be different in the world. The experience of communicating through written communication, through gestures, we're very loving people. And when we experience any kind of harm or hurt, of course, we will show that harm and hurt. And I think you saw some of that in the film Coda. But overall, I can say that the experience is just wonderful and just have a nice introduction to understand what it's like to have a different way of being. And once you understand that, that can be applied to others as well. Yeah. Part of the story that's painful for all of us is around the, the largest and fastest growing market of people in the United States and in the world are individuals who have a hearing loss that they've experienced later in life. By 20, 50, 20% 20 of the world population will be legally deaf by measures of hearing loss. Hmm. So 20% of the world population. And I've seen so many wonderful executives, and this is true, I think, predominantly for males who begin to lose their hearing, but are in denial about it. Uh, because of that denial, they have a very difficult time. It's, it's difficult to accept you losing your hearing and becoming hard of hearing or becoming deaf later on in life. You miss out on information, you miss out on communication, and all of a sudden your performance is degraded, you know, within just a couple of years time. People don't know, you know, that they're missing out on information when they're out on the street. And the next thing you know, they may not have a job. So I think it, it's undiagnosed hearing loss that leads to such uh, difficult stories around people such as this. So we don't talk enough about people in our families and our environments who are experiencing hearing loss. And if you just ask, what do you need to be able to communicate well? How can we make you feel more included in our family conversations or in whatever it is that we're doing together? Sometimes you have to slow down for one another. You have to be willing to really spend the time and attention and shift your way of being and behavior. I, I can share with you a story. Uh, my mm -hmm. grandfather on my mother's side lost his hearing when he was in his 50s. And the way that the family compensated to communicate with him was he had seven children and, you know, a big, large table that would be needed to fit seven people or seven children made it very difficult for him to catch the conversation. So we would always put someone to the right of him because I noticed that the family had this habit formed that when other people would be seated next to him, they would be able to talk to him. And so we would rotate in and out of that seat beside him just to keep him company, to be able to have him being able to be engaged in conversation with someone. And he was happy to see everyone else conversing happily in the room, but he wanted to connect with someone. And it was always that person seated next to the right of him. So there were always ways that families can communicate and adapt their communication, not just in the family environment, but in the workplace too. So, so Bobby, that 20% figure is astonishing. Um, is that a new phenomenon? Is that just a matter of aging or is it because we just have louder society now with technology and stuff? Or that's a staggering figure. Yeah, it is. It really is. And uh, I think the World Health Organization has uh, shared that this is a statistic that is because a lot of the noise pollution, uh, a real one. I mean, it's funny because podcasts, right? If somebody is out running and they have earbuds in and they're listening to a podcast or listening to music loud, people don't realize that when you're exercising, the flow of the blood actually goes more to your heart because it's working so hard for circulation purposes that you have loud music or maybe a great podcast that you're listening to while exercising. The blood is not there to protect your ears as it otherwise would if you weren't exercising. And so that's an example of where People are harmed by noise pollution, and it's so important to protect your hearing. Hearing health is so important. It, yes. It's essential for people. 
That's and amazing. I, I'm going to. Um, that uh, you could become, you know, hard of hearing, you could become deaf, and yet the world is still a beautiful place. Yeah. You know, the way we adapt to that and the way of the roles those around us adapt really is a really way to show caring and love for one another. Absolutely. Um, so, um, ladies and gentlemen, again today on the Caring Economy, we have Roberta, who we call Bobby Cardano, who's the president of, of the world-renowned Gallaudet University in Washington, D.C., the higher education institution for the deaf community. Um, Bobby, if people want to be in touch with you or learn more either about the topic or even hearing loss, um, what are some resources uh, to, to check out online? Should we just go to gallaudet.edu? Should we follow you on LinkedIn or any top sites for the hearing to check out? Sure, sure. So, yeah, we have a great website here at Gallaudet. So you can follow us on social media. Basically, everything I do is posted there. And that's the easiest place to follow is there on social media. But I also have my own LinkedIn page. You can find me there as well. And those are two things. We also have an organization. We have two schools that are uh, part of what we call the Laurent Claire National Education Center. And uh, we have a national platform through that center that provides services to children from birth to 21, providing resources and educational resources for families, professionals, and children. So both of those websites are a great way to uh, tap into resources. Mm -hmm. We also have clinical services here. We have faculty members who conduct research. We have the ability to provide direct services to individuals here at Gallaudet as well in clinical settings. I would recommend people visit Gallaudet. Just come and visit the campus. There's nothing like visiting us here. You have to see it to believe it, to experience it. Being a part of the signing community is such a rich, fun experience. One other thing I wanted to add um, as to how Gallaudet is leading, is leading in the way of developing understanding around the history of our country and the importance of really attending to the legacies of slavery and discrimination and oppression that have been experienced. Mm -hmm. Here at Gallaudet, we have an emerging project that's being built on our campus and we're putting, I guess you would say as part of our larger economic development that's happening along Sixth Street, which borders our community, we're putting in place an anchor, which will be a garden and pathway that serves as a tribute to a mother who fought for educational access for elementary school for her young black son, black deaf son. And this was a time when Washington, D.C. and the university school at this time did not admit Black children. They had to go to other schools for the deaf. And so this mother challenged the policies that were in place. Um, she was able to win one of two lawsuits, and it was that lawsuit then that became the legal strategy behind Brown versus Board of Education. Wow. So... Uh, that was decided in 1954, but we are coming together to celebrate the mother and her fight for educational access for her. She had four children, three of them were black deaf boys and she had a hearing daughter as well, but that family, uh, the children are still alive and we want to be able to recognize the history of the black deaf community here at Gallaudet. When people come and just experience this story and realize how little we know about one another and how little we know about the history of Black deaf people in the larger context of the Black community in the United States and in the world. So this is a story for all individuals, really. It's a story of learning, of fighting for a mother's fight, for her uh, educational rights, for her young children. It's a fight to be able to see the potential for all children, regardless of their race, ethnicity, their mm. identities, regardless of all of that, but their right to education. Yes. And also here at Gallaudet, it reflects the complexity of the intersectionality of our community. Right now, our undergraduate student body, 48% of our undergraduate community are BIPOC members or BIPOC identified. So 48% is, is just representing the fact that we really bring people together who share the commonality of deafness. And so it's a different, uh, beautiful community, a different mm -hmm. community, and we have a lot to offer the world. And that's my goal. I invite people to engage with us to support our raising of $23 million to create this memorial in honor of Louise B. Miller and join us in our efforts Join us in our ability to share this story that the world and others will be able to celebrate our community, our diversity, and stories that are yet to be told.
As you say, it really is beautiful. I, I, my mind's racing with the people and organizations I'd love to introduce you to or, or help you with on that. It's, um, it, you know, I believe with social justice, it's Wonderful. never done. Thank you. We appreciate that. Yes. Sure. But I mean, for example, we have a big commitment at the British uh, Embassy where I'm an, oh, I'm a, I run comms for the consulate in New York, but I'm regularly with my colleagues at the embassy. And, um, you know, we've been doing things with Howard University and some of the high schools there. Um, but I'd love to have Gallaudet somehow do something with us. And we'll just have to figure out the, the time and the place. I'm sure there's lots of English ties to the history of the school. Um, yes, let's do that. Let's do that. Absolutely. To that point, and literally just, tidbit. go ahead. Yeah, just an interesting tidbit to share here that uh, Gallaudet was the dream of a group of deaf people back in the early 1800s who wrote a paper about this notion that they should have a national college. I mean, back in the day, deaf people couldn't go to college. They graduate from high school, but they had nowhere to go for college. Uh -huh. So Edward Minor Gallaudet had this idea and he went to Congress to get a charter for this university to come into existence. It was the first charter of its kind, the first time uh, well, Abraham Lincoln signed this charter during the Civil War, I should add. And what's fascinating about that is that um, the, the president is the patron of the university. It was about six years after that charter was signed for Gallaudet during the struggle that many universities, uh, land grant universities, were not accepting uh, black students. There was a movement in Congress to pass another charter for the founding of Howard University. So their charter is based on Gallaudet's charter. And that's why Howard and Gallaudet are always somehow tied together because of our histories being inseparable. Yes. So good friends and both of us have bisons as our mascot so that's another and also over your that. shoulder there's abraham lincoln who's the great unifier of all so i love that absolutely right um so i'm definitely going to uh, follow up on that i um you know people didn't i didn't know this but uh, we've just we're in the middle of refurbishing the embassy and the facilities in dc and the the common space which is a beautiful new redesigned space is called the North Star, which is named after Frederick Douglass's abolitionist newspaper. What I didn't realize is that Frederick Douglass not only went to the UK for a couple of years to campaign against slavery, but his freedom was bought by two English women. So there's incredible uh, transatlantic connections around the slave trade. And also I think the, the, the dialogues that we need to be having now to move forward. Um, so anyway, I digress. We will follow up on that. Um, oh, that'd be great. And I also wanted to share with you that my goal here is to be able to see as much of DC as we can. There's no excuse for me not to visit the embassy. I would love to see it. So please do invite me to come down. I would love to be able to come. We'll do that. And then we'll come to you as well. So um, let's go back to Coda for a second. I was so touched by the movie. I'm sure you, you, I'm sure much of it you love and much of it they got right. Mary Matlin was just genius from decades ago in Children of a Lesser God. And now um, what, what, was, what was maybe in addition to what was great about the film, what um, did it get wrong or what would you want to amplify, I guess is what I would say, so that people don't walk away in a superficial way with their knowledge of the deaf community? Yeah, sure. Well, the first thing I can say is uh, what everyone should just sit in awe of and watch with great appreciation. I think the statistics show that 43% of that film, 42% of the film is done in sign language. Mm -hmm. So 40, over 40% 40 of the film, uh, the lines are done in ASL. So it's the most number of minutes that sign language has ever been seen on screen in a you know mainstream major motion movie hit. So if you look back to Children of a Lesser God that you mentioned, Marley's very first uh, acting experience, I, I watched that movie with great frustration. I can remember being young because they would film her as she was signing and she'd be so angry. And then they would suddenly cut her signs out of the frame. So we wouldn't be able to understand. I mean, people who were hearing were listening to the voiceover, but they weren't able to see the signing. And we as deaf members of the community weren't able to access her lines because they would cut out the signing. I remember I was in New York City at the time and I was so excited when that film came out. But now watching CODA, 
oh, what a different experience in a much more positive way, really being able to track signing and being able to make it visible the entire time. So yeah. the art has actually changed. And I think, you know, like we set up our film today, I said important the way how we uh, make sure that our hands are in the frame of the film to make sure you can see both our hands and our face and being able to make sign language more visible when it's on the uh, video like this. So now more and more people are doing this because they understand the importance of being able to see body expression and facial expression and signs. It helps you connect with other people better. So for me, that movie was just full of things just like that. I mean, the film has really changed. The film industry has changed yeah. in terms of, you know, um, cinematographers and videographers, the way they're working with deaf people, it, it's dramatically changed the way they do their work and it's made it more of a, a visible thing and made our sign language as a community more visible to the mainstream society. I think one thing that some people had issue with where there were scenes in the movie where deaf people, you know, had a right to an interpreter under the laws of to these days, the American with Disabilities Act, but there were some people that felt that even the timing of the film, you know, the era that the film was supposed to be portraying, there should have been interpreters represented there in the film. When I see that, I realize that we want people to appreciate that, yes, in fact, if people have a right to request interpreting services, to have interpreters, and when interpreters are there, it can really change the ability that we have to interact, to be a part of the experience, and can transform the way we experience one another, just as we are today in this interview. So I think it's important though to observe in the film the impact when there are no interpreters to provide that access. The film does tell that story well. You can see the impact of not having interpreting services to ease communication access. Mm -hmm. So it's the unfairness of the system that's highlighted in that kind of a situation. Yeah. And the third thing I would say about the film, it's just fascinating. The story is focused on the hearing daughter of the deaf family and, um, I think CODA, you know, I guess it can't be a CODA too, but I would hope that the next movie would be about the deaf son and his family member with the CODA sister, but highlighting the deaf son, because there's so many other stories that are yet to be told that have not yet been shared. And the last piece for me, I think, and speaking just for, you know, CODAs throughout the United States, many CODAs were disappointed that the young actress who played Dakota, while she was great and no one would dispute her talent in that film whatsoever, yet at the same time, there was a disappointment that she herself is not a Coda, mm -hmm. that they wanted the true portrayal of someone who actually is a Coda to play that role. So I can understand the argument, I do, and I appreciate the, the pain or that they felt in not having one of themselves portrayed in that role. And uh, I have two children myself who are CODAs and their experience is very different uh, than others when you have deaf parents versus those who don't have deaf parents. So to replace that with someone who didn't grow up with that experience, not really having the experience and the heart of that way of being, yeah. being a true nature of, of being a CODA and be able to show that on the screen was something that was missing. Yeah, you know, I thought, you know, you used the word beautiful so much today, and that's exactly what I thought about the audition. We're giving it away for those folks who haven't seen the movie, but you need to see it. Um, when she auditions at Berkeley and sings, um, I've looked at life from both sides now. And by using the sign language and her parents and brother up in the uh, auditorium above, it made that song so much richer and more beautiful between the words being sung, but also the sign language. I mean, it just made, it went technicolor, what was perhaps black and white. So I, I can really appreciate just with that one scene how having sign language can only make one's life richer. So um, I wanted to ask you about um, intersection, intersectionality. Oh, can I tell you just a funny story about that? So that was a favorite moment for so many people in the movie Coda. But you know what my favorite moment of the film was? It's actually a different one. Do you remember when she was performing in high school and mm -hmm. there were no interpreters and she was just singing away and, um, you know, going on and on with her song and the parents were in the audience and you saw Troy look over to Marley and say something like, what's for dinner tonight? And she looks back at him and she's like, oh, maybe we'll have pasta. I don't know. I laughed so hard at that because that was my parents. 
right? They had three children whenever we go to, I went to public school, by the way, all three of us did. So we would do performances. We would do things with hearing students and we never had an interpreter for my parents. But my parents came to every single performance, every single sporting event. They sat there not understanding anything that was going on in spoken language around them. So they would be the ones in the back of the auditorium. And I thought oh, that's exactly probably what they did, like talking about what's going to have for dinner, what we need to do this weekend. I only imagine my parents having those same conversations conversations. And a yeah, funny story related to that, I won the state championship for forensics in my junior year of high school. And uh, I was supposed to go up on stage to receive my award for winning this uh, event. And so I was seated with my parents in the audience, no interpreter during the time. And so back then I had a little more hearing than my parents did. So whatever I could catch, I kind of signed for my parents, sort of interpret, if you will, for them in the audience. But when it was time for me to receive my award, I walked out of the audience, went up on stage and they began talking. And all of a sudden, right at that moment, my hearing aid battery died. <laughs> <laughs> and I couldn't understand a single thing that was being said. So I looked at my parents and I said, sorry, my hearing aid battery died. And we were all laughing away. We understood nothing that was going on. But, you know, this is just exactly what happens in our life, you know, in the most yeah. inopportune moments. But I just could do nothing but laugh in that moment. Yeah. And when I saw the film, I thought, oh, how true that is. Yeah. I think film hits us each differently in different ways. Yeah. But it was a great show. And I want to thank Apple for really releasing that and getting it out there. They did a Absolutely. great job with that show. They did. And you know what? It just underscores, again, you said earlier how, you know, hire the deaf person. They're nimble. They're they're problem solvers. So clearly it's, it's ingrained. Um, I want to ask you just a couple more questions, one about intersectionality and one about tips for uh, young people. Um, so intersectionality, you are a, a deaf woman, you are a woman, you are a lesbian, you are out parent of two kids. Um, can you talk a little bit about intersectionality in the deaf community? Is it, is it somehow unique? Is it similar to any sort of intersectional community? Right. You know, I think what's most important for people to understand and, and for each of us, honestly, to learn. And, and I would say I learned this lesson uh, maybe 20, 25 years ago. Someone taught me this and it just made so much sense. We all have intersectional identities. I mean, all of us do. But what's really important to be self-aware around is which identity is under the most stress at any given moment in any given situation and why that's the case. So for example, when I was working for 30 years as I did as an attorney, as a healthcare executive and a nonprofit as an executive and higher education as a leader in all of those environments, I worked with people who could hear, everyone was hearing. So my stressor most often was as an identity as a deaf person. I couldn't hear, I'd have to figure out how to have access to get communication to make sure I was tracking everything that was going on. So my stressed identity was my deaf identity. But then when I went to the Metro School for the Deaf, the charter school that I founded, the board meeting, I'd walk into the school and everybody used sign language. So my stressed identity wasn't my deaf identity as a deaf person. Instead, my stressed identity would be around, you know, maybe because I was a lesbian and I was working in the K through 12 setting. So I'd have to be very, very cautious and not be overtly displaying members of my family or the choices that my family made. Um, you know, there's no one who can argue about children and the love for children, but I would definitely feel that as a tricky time in America where you know, the Defense for Marriage Act was as of prominence. And so I would very often feel being in a role of protecting my family. And you probably experienced that. It was a very yeah. difficult time for many of us. So as a result, I was very careful with that identity. When I would go out in public, anything involved in education, I was highly aware of the stressor to that identity there. And then being a female, I would feel that identity being under stress. If I was in all male environments and my identity as a woman would be stressed, not as a person who was deaf or as a lesbian, but as a female. So what we can do to help one another is to first take note as to which identity may be under stress at any given point in time, and then to understand how we can support one another to reduce the stress that the identity has experienced. Wow. And it helps to be self-aware, to talk to people about it, to be able to say, you know what, this identity that I'm having right now is feeling stressed and you need some help out here, or how can we change the environment so I can feel more comfortable with this particular identity? I really think we need to talk more about our intersectionalities 
and about the complexities of all of our identities. It, it's a little bit of a ridiculous notion to me to understand that our jurisprudence here in this country is such that we think we can settle matters based on one particular characteristic that a person has. Yep. You know, we are human beings and above all that is so true. So we really want to shift to more of a human rights framework that yep. most of the world uses, most of the rest of the world uses. I think we have a lot of growing up to do in that area in this country, and a lot of learning remains for us as to how we can make improvements. And I think it starts with the community first, where we have to model this amongst ourselves. We have to live it. We have to change ourselves locally and then expand out further from there and have a larger systemic impact later. But we have to live and breathe these practices and recognize the humanity that each one of us holds, because yes. that, I think, is the story of today and as it relates to inter intersectionality. That is so uh, eloquently stated and uh, compelling. I, I absolutely agree with you. And it's quite soothing to hear you say that. If I, I often find myself these days just saying, when someone sends me an email about a news story or something breaking, I just say, we all need to calm down a bit, right? Like before we jump to judgment, why don't we just at least try and understand or walk in the other person's shoes a bit? Um, so I, I love your advice there. My last question for you, Bobby, is um, words of wisdom for young people or even people who are mid-career or later career who maybe have been disrupted. Um, how, do you, how do you advise them to strike out on their path in life? Hmm. Well, you know, uh, my parents would always emphasize the importance of being curious and of learning. If you continue to learn throughout your life and continue to challenge yourself to grow beyond what you currently know and who you currently are, life will just shape itself and create its path for you. You just have to be curious and be willing to learn. And you have to be willing to take some of those hard knocks along the way and get feedback from people that you might not wanna hear, but it, it does require growth of you as a result. Yeah. With growth, with continual change and a willingness to hear feedback. And I think this is especially true for young people. You know, if I think back to my journey and the feedback that I received, I would say it probably took me a while, you know, and I love hearing feedback, but sometimes the feedback that you get is based on the other person's need and maybe not on what you necessarily did. But if you can learn to be more responsive to other people's needs, I think that you can change and grow and create more positive relationships with others. Yes. So yeah. I think sometimes we take feedback personally, but to understand that the growth opportunity is there, that you can meet someone else's needs. I think we spend so much time talking about how to get our own needs met. And while I support that, we do need to make sure and do good self-care and make sure we get our needs met. That's very important. But it's also important not to forget other people and their needs, their need to feel belong, to feel loved, and to feel cared for. And if we all would just do a little bit more of that, I think the world would so much uh, get along so much better than it does now. And hopefully there'd be more support than available to everyone. Here, here, Bobby. Um, I think those are the final best words I've heard in a long time. So ladies and gentlemen, I do wanna thank President Roberta Cordano, AKA Bobby Cordano from Gallaudet University in Washington, the historic and world-class university for the deaf community. Bobby, we have to get together again. We've got more to do together. Thank you so much for being with me on The Caring Economy. Oh, well, and thank you so much, Toby. Thank you for this awesome time together and thank you for the work you're doing. The show is great as is your leadership and I hope to see you again soon. Thank you so much. Thank you.